Thank you for coming tonight. I'd like you to take your hymn book, turn to number 336. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. Number 336. We'll stand together as we sing. Number 336. <laughs> My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. Through me he died, for me he lived, and everlasting life and light he freely his grace has planned it all, tis mine but to believe, and recognize his work of love, and Christ receive for me. Number 610, a new song. I'm going to sing and you're going to sing. So we're going to echo each other, all right? I sing a new song. I'll sing it, then you sing it. Go. I sing a new song since Jesus came. Serve a new master. Wear a new name. Walk a new road. Have a new goal, know a new peace. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Bass is at your chance. Down deep in my soul. All right? Just let it rumble. All right, you ready? Oh, we're going to switch it. We're going to switch it. You're singing first, and I'll sing in second. Ready? Ready? We can do this. And go. I sing. I'd sing a new song since Jesus came. Serve a new master, wear a new name, walk a new road, have a new goal, know a new peace down deep in my down deep in my Okay, now ladies, you sing first, and the guys will sing second. Ready, ladies, go. I sing, I sing a new song since Jesus came. Serve a new master, wear a new name, walk a new road, have a new goal. No a new peace down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Good job, good job. Well, happy Valentine's Day to you. I shared this verse with uh, some of the staff this morning in 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So whether you are celebrating Valentine's Day today or you are celebrating Single Awareness Day, whatever it is you're doing on that, I hope that it's been a good day for you. And know God loves you and uh, he wants to spend eternity there. With you, So I'm glad that you're here this evening. Mr. Ron Young, will you open us in prayer, please, sir? No one cares. 
Number 591, I don't know what these are either, so sing big. Number 591, he's able, we'll stand together as we sing. some people asking how Pat Montgomery is doing, and uh, she actually just texted me while I was on the stage, uh, and she said, the surgeon said that it went well, and I had already known that from Don and uh, Pat texting my wife and stuff, and so she said, the surgeon went well, but hard work to come, and thank you for praying, and so if you would, please pray for her. She had her knee replacement surgery today, uh, and they've already had her up and walking. She said, the leg's still numb, so it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Won't stay that way, but you know, uh, just pray for her in her recovery from that uh, on, on those things. And then uh, please be in prayer for Beth Rollins and the loss of uh, Jerry. And then we're still thinking of Desmond Chung in rehab in good spirits, but just a little ways to go on that and the decisions uh, that they are going to need to make there. Uh, and then pray for Adrian Curry, who had the funeral was yesterday, uh, and just pray for uh, her grandmother passing away there uh, and then going to be coming back. 
uh, here soon. And then this week, this Saturday, am I correct, Mrs. Kenton, is your sister's funeral there. So that's down in Hollywood. So please be praying for her uh, and uh, the family there, if you would. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We are thankful for your prayers that uh, you pray for us, Lord, and the intercessor that you are, the Holy Spirit, praying with groanings which cannot be uttered. And, and Lord, I thank you that we can come to you with our petitions and requests and our thanksgiving and our praise. We do praise you, Lord, for what you've done uh, in our lives and salvation, the love that you extended to us that we might know what true love is and know what that true love will sacrifice. And thank you for dying for our sins. Thank you for sacrificing for your church uh, and giving your life for it. And may we give you honor and glory in return for that. We ask you to be with these requests that are we've mentioned. We think of Beth with the loss of Jerry and Adrian with the loss of her grandmother and Euphemia with her sister, all of these that are heartaches and uh, bereavements and funerals and, and those hard times. And we ask that you'd help her, uh, help each of them, Lord. We ask you to be with Pat Montgomery as she had her knee replacement surgery and thankful that it went well. Uh, but a long road of recovery now that you would just give her the strength that she needs in her knee and that you would help her to recover quickly and be with Don as he's still recovering from his back surgery. Think of Mary Dunn and others with cancer in our church and those that are dealing with such great heartaches. And uh, it may not be a physical illness, but it may be another thing that they're dealing with. And we ask that you'd help each one and come near and dear. And may we draw them nigh to you. And he says, if we do, we'll, we'll draw, nigh to, draw nigh to us. So, Lord, help us this evening, be the preaching of your word across our property. May it be clear, and may we respond to it in faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Further things uh, to go on as well. Uh, and so if you would turn there. While you're turning there, let me let you know some things coming up. We've got February the 18th. That is this week. We are going to be having a fellowship just right after the service. Uh, and if you're going to stay for that, we just ask that you bring some kind of appetizer or hors d'oeuvre. It doesn't need to be anything big, uh, but it's just a time of fellowship, snacking and talking and everything else. And we'll play some games and have some fun with the kids and with adults. And if you don't want to stay for the games, that's fine. We'll have some chairs if you want to watch or if you want to go home. That's fine, too. Uh, but that'll be this Sunday night, and we'll have some fun and fellowship and some food along the way. So that, that is this week. The very next week, that is the 25th, my wife and I will be traveling up to Pensacola, and we're going to be doing some teacher recruiting there for the educator recruitment from PCC. And then in March, we'll be heading up to Crown uh, to do some recruiting there as well. And so if you would pray for us in those regards, uh, we'd appreciate that. March 16th is coming up in just about a month or so, 
And uh, so in the back, we do have a sign-up sheet. This is a men's activity. This is going to the shooting range to shoot guns, do something manly, something like that. Okay, so we're going to have fun, uh, and uh, we'll have the cost uh, nailed down a little bit more for you coming up. I think it's going to be around $30 a person uh, on that. We have to rent the ranges, and then you have to have a professional. Okay, so, uh, you know, some safety officer, which is a good thing. Uh, there on the range as well, so there's there's some expense to it, and then uh, there. If you don't have a gun, you like to rent a gun there, you can. I probably think we will have enough weapons to have a small armory, most likely, uh, for things, and uh, so we'll have a good time with that on March the 16th, and so I want to let you know those things are, are there. March the 30th, I believe, is our next visitation, but that literally is the day before Easter, and so March 31st is Easter this year, and so the 30th we will have uh, a visitation but there and we'll go and invite as many people as we can. People will come on Easter and people will come on Christmas. And so invite someone to come and start inviting them now. And uh, Brother Case and I are sitting down talking how we want uh, Easter to go and all of the different stuff uh, that's going on there. And I know the choirs already start preparing with Easter music. I love Easter music. I love Christmas music. We get to sing about our Savior. And we'll get to do that every week, don't we? But uh, it's a special time at Easter where we get to really belt it out and shout it out on those songs. So we'll be looking forward to that March the 31st. So let's talk tonight just for a little bit about Daniel. We're going to call him the most impressive teenager that ever lived. He was a model of knowledge academically, wisdom spiritually for a long period of time. Some think that he was about 14 years old when he was taken to Babylon in captivity. We see him at the end of Daniel at 81 years old, still staying faithful to God, prophesying, doing all kinds of things. It goes through four different kings that the Babylonians have, and he stays faithful to the Lord all of that time. His influence then influences those that are around him. We call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those people were friends of Daniel. And it's amazing that those friends that were wise and did well were friends with somebody who did wise and did well. I don't think that's coincidence, by the way, because they were attracted to one another with their friendship uh, in that. And so what we're looking to, and the, really the, the concept here tonight, is developing your child's gifts. What gifts do your, does your child have, and how can they be developed for the glory of God? That's the key. It's not so that they can become rich and put you in a nicer nursing home when you get older, or uh, they, they can become famous so that uh, you have something to tout to all of your friends that my child did this. It is for the glory of God and for the service of God, and you'll see that as we go throughout this lesson tonight. And so it's important to look at Daniel because of some things that it says about him in his life. Every parent believes that his or her child is exceptional in some certain way. That my child can do this. It may be building Legos, but my child can do this. And it, they are exceptional. We see gifts and talents, and sometimes others miss them, and we remind them that they miss them, correct? We want them to have opportunities to succeed and for them to shine in their giftedness. And each child has potential, and each child has something that the Lord can use for his glory. And so we're going to look at Daniel tonight. He's arguably the most gifted of all of teenagers that you'll find in the Bible. He was taken captive from Israel to Babylon. Some commentaries believe he's just a teenager when that is taken. The story of Daniel is remarkable, not so much in that he was gifted, but because he stood for God on many different occasions, that he didn't waver, that he did what was right in a land where really he didn't have to. He's away from mom and dad. He's in a foreign land that doesn't believe in God. Any kind of debauchery, sin, Anything he wants to say, anything he wants to do, anything he wants to be, he, he's free to do that because there really are not a lot of restrictions on his life besides working in the kingdom and for the king and for the princes and those type things. 
But at an early age, Daniel was given tutoring and cultivating in these gifts while being taught to also develop deep-seated convictions. And if he doesn't have those convictions before he turns 14, if he doesn't have those convictions before he's taken captive, we don't read about Daniel in our Bible. And so that had to have been given to him before all of this other takes place in the book of Daniel, which means mom and dad, whoever they are, have developed these things in their child. So how can we develop the giftedness in our children, placing in them at the same time the convictions that they will need that when you send them out of the nest or you kick them out of the nest, one of the two, they are going to be not only successful and productive members of society, but they are going to be ones that honor and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at this this evening. I want you to see the first thing, and we'll jump right into it, is to determine the priority of character. Character is very important. You say, yeah, my child's a character. Have you seen them? That's not the character we're talking about. We're talking about developing virtues in their life. Look at Daniel chapter 1. Let's look at verse 4. He's talking about children in whom was no blemish. They were well-favored, skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So Daniel had an aptitude for learning foreign languages. He said, we're going to take these children, and we're going to find them that learn foreign languages. Now, I know English. I know a little bit of Spanglish. Okay? And it's not very good at that point. It's kind of in between. It doesn't make sense at all. No, that's where I'm, I know no other language beyond that. For those of you who are bilingual or trilingual or multilingual in this room, God bless you. It's a wonderful trait to have and a wonderful thing. I did take two years of Spanish in high school. I know how to order at Taco Bell. I took two years of Greek in college. I know how to look in a lexicon. That's about all I know. And they're taking these children and going, okay, you're going to understand science. You're going to be able to stand before the king. You're going to know proper etiquette and proper procedures. And you're going to know all of these parliamentary things. We're going to teach you the Chaldean language. And you're going to learn that. And you're going to speak that. And they found these. And so first thing is this. He was mentally sharp. He, he was very much up for the task. That, that we have a child here that is, is gifted in the mental capacity there. The second part of this is that he was socially poised. If you look at verse 4 again, it says that he had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace. The word ability means a proper manner or a poise about it. Confidence. That is something that I do believe does come natural to some and it's not natural to others. But I will tell you this, it can be developed in every child. A sense of confidence can be developed there if we will teach them the proper ways to do things. So that when an adult comes up to them, they can look them in the eye and shake their hand. And we teach that. That, that when a child comes before a presence uh, of an adult in a conversation that's happening, they don't interrupt all the time. And they're taught to say please, and they're taught to say thank you, and they're taught to say yes ma'am and no ma'am, and they're, they're taught right proper ways in different areas of life. Some of that will come through experience, but most of that will come through you guiding them through the process. And so there are many different things to get involved in. If your school will offer different things, whether it is science-related or whether it's academically related on that or whether it is in the arts on things, there are different areas in which you should involve them. There's a sport, let them play the sport and let them get involved. They may not be the best athlete, or if they're the best athlete, they may not be the best person in the arts or literature. 
uh, if they're the best of this, they may not be the best academically. They, they may be well-rounded to where they're a jack of all trades and master of none type thing. But they're poised and controlled and confident and knowledgeable in many different areas. This is where I believe, Dad, if you've got a son, if you have a son, uh, then you need to involve them in the work that you do. If you're changing the oil, then teach your son how to do it. If you've got tools in your hand, have your son help you with the tools. These two, I understand. Get them a fake pair of tools that are plastic, but let them play with them and let them do different things. They need to learn a skill. They need to learn to do those things. And, and, and ladies with, with the mothers that are, are working and doing the things uh, that you would do, the, the frugalness of uh, a, a budget uh, on a meal or the cooking that, that happens there or uh, the, the cleaning that takes place or the management aspects of the home that you're not doing everything, but you're knowing how to manage all of it, that whites don't go with darks and permanent press doesn't go with towels and those type things that, that uh, I know in college, I just threw everything in the same washer and it survived four years of college. A little beat it up, but that's okay. Uh, I've learned better now, but college is college. You know, you got to get by and you're trying to dry it all for $1.50 and it just doesn't work. So uh, anyway, so... There's a poise and a confidence that takes place. When we're confronted with a dilemma, and when he was confronted with the dilemma of eating foods that were against his convictions, he had confidence to say, I'm not doing that. He had the poise to talk to the person and say, what do you think about this? I don't think Daniel goes in and demands going, I ain't eating that. You forget that. Uh, I don't think he went, ew, I'm not eating that. Okay? I don't think he did that either. I, I think that his poise and his confidence of this is against what I believe that I cannot eat. Would it be possible, why don't we do this? Why don't we have a trial, a test for 10 days, and in these 10 days, if we will eat this, this pulse and, and water and you let them eat their meat, at the end of 10 days, if we're stronger and better for it, and I'll keep my conviction and you can see these people eating their meat. And the Lord honored that. What happened? He stood to his convictions. He was poised in his answer. He wasn't demanding. He wasn't argumentative. But he was poised. And he was confident in what he was saying. And so Daniel chapter 1 verse 9 says, Now God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Here's what I would encourage you. If you've got a young child uh, or a teenager or uh, somebody who's 14 like this, here's what I would encourage you. Encourage them to talk to all of you people, to go up and hold a conversation with you. Uh, teach your child what a proper conversation asks and then listens to the answer, to be able to engage, to be able to figure out what is it that you do, how do you tick, how do you think, and and just learn. And I think the teenager that can do that, that can have those conversations, that can converse, it does a couple things. Number one, that teenager learns a lot if they'll just listen. Secondly, it draws the heart together. And what it will do is draw the heart of that teenager to that, that, that adult in, in that friendship or that learning stage, and, and there is that unity that we have as a church. It's where it's not the adults versus the teens and the teens versus the adults, ultimate paintball. No, we're not doing that. Okay? We're not hurling things at each other. We're not the enemy of one another. There's a confidence and a poise that, that helps. There was, there was a, a, a tender love, it says here. There was a respect that was given to Daniel. Uh, and so in Daniel chapter 2, he gets another opportunity. Verses 12 through 16, it says this in verse 12, the king was angry and very furious. You go down to verse 13, they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. So at this point, the king's angry. They're trying to slay and kill David and his friends. Look at verse 14. Then Daniel answered him with counsel and wisdom. This is a young man. This is, this is just a, a, a child in, in our eyes, a a teenager, and yet he's answering with counsel and with wisdom. Go down to verse 16. It says, then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king 
the interpretation. What a bold thing to do, to go to the king and say, hey, king, could you wait a few days? I'll have the answer for you. King, wait. Those two words don't go together. And yet, here he is with poise, confidence, conviction in God that allows him to excel in what he's doing socially. It's no wonder that a teenager with the giftedness of Daniel ended up in the king's court. Now, what is surprising is that that a teenager in the king's court had the character and the backbone of Daniel to honor God. And, and so there, there is this aspect of confidence and poise. Now, now, Daniel was gifted, but Daniel was guided as well. If you look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, this is really the key to the book of Daniel. Some would say that this is the key verse to Daniel, that it says Daniel 1, verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He had convictions. He had principles. It was settled in his heart. It guided his decision in a crisis moment. Now, where did he get that? Did that just come naturally to Daniel? He's just, he's a born leader. That's who he is, uh, and that's who he's going to become, and, and that's uh, that just because Daniel did all that in himself. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think that he was guided. I think he's guided by his parents when he's young, and I think once he comes to that, he's guided by the Holy Spirit. He's, he's guided uh, by, by God there, uh, Holy Spirit not yet been given uh, at this point, but God giving him these decisions. What makes Daniel's story even more significant is, is what his parents did that internalized those convictions. We, we looked at, was it last week we looked at? the principles and the policies and trying to get those established in the home uh, that uh, was two weeks ago. And then last week we looked at uh, the influence of a parent. The influence of these parents lasted long beyond their life. Because once Daniel was taken to Babylon, he never sees his parents again. I don't know if they're killed. Uh, I don't know if, if they are just taken to a different part of Babylon or, or what happens. I, I think that when the Babylonians came in, they kind of destroyed everything and just took what they thought was profitable to them. I don't know that Daniel's parents are profitable to him. But Daniel was, and so they took him, these young men there. But the convictions that they had already established, it's kind of like a Jochebed and a Moses, that those convictions that she had in those early years of life, those convictions she established with them, uh, with Moses, stuck with him for the next 120 years. And so as we look at the, the convictions there, is it ever just not worth the fight? Shouldn't we just, you know, not argue with our children? And shouldn't we just give in? And it's just, I'm tired, and I really don't want to do this tonight. It's Valentine's Day for all uh, given purposes for that. I, I really don't want to have this conversation, but it's those training times, those conviction times of laying that groundwork that helps a Daniel at 81 still stand for God, or a Moses at 80 change careers and go lead the nation of Israel out of the promised, out to the promised land, out of Egypt. Daniel's parents seem to have understood the importance of cultivating the heart. And here's key. Outward conformity is not the goal. Well, they did what I told them to do. Great. Here's a gold star. Okay. You can affect an outward conformity without ever affecting the heart. Don't have to turn here, but I'd write this reference down. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9. Here he is speaking to the parents. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul, the mind, the emotions, and the will, keep thy soul diligently lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. So he says, keep your soul, keep your life, keep your convictions, live that life, be an example to them, because they're going to either follow what you're doing in the pattern of your life, or they're going to, to depart from it if you're not consistent. He's saying, Keep it diligently. 
And then he talks about uh, that uh, you're going to teach thy sons, and then you're going to teach your grandsons. Where does the grandsons come in? Your example. All right, Grandpa, okay, you're in the room. you got a grandson. Okay, your example matters to them. Your example, still live diligently to keep your soul diligently, affects that child. And so you can teach your sons and your sons' sons. It also talks in, in the Old Testament about the sins of the father reaching unto the third generation. Well, I don't want that to be my legacy to have that happen. I'd rather be able to teach my sons and my sons' sons the diligence of keeping my heart and keeping their heart and following the Lord. We take heed to our own lives, diligently obeying God from the heart, and then we teach our children and our grandchildren and the emphasis is on the heart, reaching the heart level. And when you reach the heart level, the child wants to do it rather than has to do it. And there's a huge difference there. Okay, if you're forcing me to do it, I'll do it, but I'm standing up on the inside when you told me to sit down on the outside. Okay? Uh, that, that's the idea. But when I can affect their heart, when I, I can give them the motive or the reason uh, there that, that's biblical and foundational, and then I live it with my life, then I can affect my child's heart. And then the process gets grounded, and the convictions last through time. So giftedness without character uh, is, the, is a tragedy in, in the guidance. Okay? So, so if I give giftedness, but I don't give them character, what I've done is I've misguided the missile. And that missile is powerful, and it is dangerous, and it's heading for the wrong target. So I must show them and give them character. So, so if I'm going to be misbalanced some way, I want to be misbalanced in the character side rather than the giftedness side. Because character is the priority. Someone define character this way. Character is doing right when no one else is around. That exemplifies Daniel. Because when, when he had the opportunity not to pray to God, when they made it and outlawed it, that you can't pray to any other God except the king, he still opens his windows and three times a day he prays. Okay. No one's there to check up on him. Now, there's people watching for sure. But he had the character to do what was right in those instances. Uh, so, character. Develop it. Number two, develop spiritual aptitudes. Develop spiritual aptitudes. Now, we're going to go from the giftedness, which is physical, uh, which is mental uh, on those things. And we can develop that. We can stretch a, a student academically. We can stretch a student giftedly, athletically. Uh, we, we, we can stretch them socially or in the arts or in literature and those type things. But, but now we're looking at how can we stretch the spiritual life of our children. Number one, observe your child. You want to notice and encourage the development of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the life of your child. It's amazing how you can see the spiritual development in a child's heart, even at a very young age. We see this in the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, there is where they're listed in verses 22 and 23, whether it's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, or temperance. Those are the things that we're looking for in their life. Where do they excel in those things? Are we seeing those things in the life of our child? God gives each Christian, including children, a spiritual gift at salvation. And I'm just going to run through them real quickly on what they are. And your child, if they're a Christian, if they're saved, will be given one of these gifts then to cultivate, to, to use for the glory of God. So here's what they are. They're found in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. There are different kinds of gifts, and they're sign gifts. And uh, these gifts are the service gifts, the, the, the gifts to be used in the local New Testament church. The first one is prophecy. Prophecy is the ability and desire to preach and teach God's word. Can you see that in a young child? Maybe. Do they share the word of God? 
Do they have a desire to proclaim that? Do they have a desire to take a track and give it to somebody else? Do they have a desire to, to see their friends around them saved? You, you can see that from an early age. I, I believe one of my gifts, as far as spiritual gifts, is the gift of, uh, of prophecy to foretell those things. I led my first person to Christ when I was eight years old in the backyard in my pool. My neighbor came over this morning. Okay? And I'm not tooting a horn or not trying to brag or anything uh, with that at all because there's been many times where I didn't witness and should have uh, in, in many different areas. But there was a desire to tell him of that truth. Can you see that in your child? There's a desire there to share that, to proclaim it, uh, to to quote, unquote, preach or teach it. There's ministry or there's helps, the ability and the desire to serve and help God's people. Uh, is there a servant's heart? Now, a servant's heart can come natural because of the gifting of the Holy Spirit, but that must be cultivated at the same time because I'd rather go play video games than help. Okay. Uh, I, I'd rather go do this than help. And so we have to put them in situations where they can help and then see how they're gifted in their helping. Number three, teaching, the ability and the desire to clearly articulate truth. Can you, they take a complex thing and explain it to you so that you understand it. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just ask your child about Roblox. Can you explain that to me? Or uh, Minecraft, can you explain this to me? Or, or uh, how does that work? Uh, can you explain that to me? And if that child clearly articulates those things to you, well, there may be an idea of teaching uh, in their spiritual giftedness. Exhortation is the ability and desire to encourage someone in their faith. Uh, this is the child that asks, Mommy, are you okay? Daddy, you okay? And, and you'll see that really young. Uh, and then they become teenagers, and you just don't know anymore. But there are, there are teenagers that are very good at this. I, I, I will, I, I'm, I'm thinking of a student right now uh, it already graduated from our school uh, on stuff. Uh, but I will tell you this. Um, my grandmother died. And at the end of class, the student came up with six Bible reference verses and gave them to me and said, these will help you. And uh, would constantly just put a note in my box, just praying for you. I'm so thankful for you. Hope you have a good day. And I'll tell you, that, that was a help. Okay. That's a spiritual giftedness uh, that, that is done. And you can see that in the life of a teenager. There's giving, the ability and desire to give to God's work and to God's people. Uh, that uh, is a spiritual gift uh, as well. Uh, my teenager doesn't have any money. Well, good. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Uh, but is there a desire to give? Because the, the giving is just the, the comes out of the desire to do it. Uh, on that. Ruling or administration, this is the ability and the desire to lead and administrate part of God's work. Uh, well, they are always really bossy, so maybe they have administration gifts. I don't know if that's the case or not, uh, but they're, they're good at organizing. They're good at putting something together and ruling in that, leading in it. Mercy is the ability or desire to feel the pain of others and help them through their trials. Uh, and so can you see these things in, in each of your children? And by the way, if you've got more than one child, you've got more than one gift in your house. If you've got more than one child, they're not all the same. Have you figured that out yet? This child is this way, just like their mother, and this one's just like me. You know, and there's, there's differences, just like the body of Christ. There are differing gifts for the glory of God, and therefore the help in your home, but therefore the glory of your Savior. Can your child be used to glorify God? Yes. And they should be. How? By observing, watching. Secondly, by applauding them. When you observe your child doing right, make a big deal out of that. I mean, applaud them literally if you have to. And they just stop and just you know, slow clap it or whatever you want, uh, sarcastically. I don't know. Uh, but make a big deal about that, that they did what was right or they did that, what, that which was good. Let your children know when they've honored you. Proverbs 10, verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son 
is the heaviness of his mother. John Getch preached a message on this, and his opening line of the message is, how much does your mom weigh? And I was, what did he just say? Okay, But the idea here is the heaviness of the mother comes from a foolish son. Well, how do you get a foolish son by not cultivating and uh, training in that? Child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame, the Bible says. And so there's a cultivation that goes along with that. Perhaps your child is going through a difficult time, but you see joy in his heart. Perhaps there was uh, an exercise meekness to uh, a referee during a ball game when a bad call was missed there. Perhaps it's developing discipline and self-control uh, in training, whether it's academically or whether it's uh, instrumental, whether it's on a ball field somewhere even beyond praising your child for the character development, point out to them that you see God working in their heart. Why? Children thrive on praise. You get a lot more flies with honey. Ever heard that statement? Okay. Children thrive on it. And some of your children, when you read the five love languages, some of your children, that's their love language. Okay. They're praise from their parents. And to listen to them say, hey, I'm proud of you for that. You know, you got ninth place out of ten people. But man, you tried your hardest. You did your best on that. I saw your effort. I saw what you did. You gave it everything you had. It wasn't good enough today for winning the prize, but oh my, I saw how good you did. I saw how well you, you did this. You're improving in this. You didn't make tenth place. Poor kid, it didn't make tenth place, did it? Those are the things that we can look at. Do they have to be huge and massive? No. These are small, everyday moments, which means, mom and dad, you've got to pay attention. You've got to get your head out of your phone. You've got to get your head out of the work. You've got to be able, when they're home and you're home, you've got to be able to interact. And if you're not, you're missing wonderful opportunities for praise. I know we get busy. I know we get uh, hardship. But look for opportunities to praise them. It's a Powerful motivator in a child's heart there. <clears throat> so, uh, someone once said this, help a child reach their full potential by catching them doing something right. And it will help them to do more things right. Last one, develop natural gifts. God has given every child natural talents and capabilities. We tend to focus on certain ones. Okay? Here's what we want. We want our child become a famous athlete, to get a shoe contract, and buy me a home. That's what I want. But we realize how few actually make the pros or even make a college team, and we realize that's probably out the window. The court or the ball field is not the most important thing in life. Their character is. Learning team building is wonderful. So I like when my children play sports for that reason. Learning from a different person, from a coach, uh, and learning how to do things right <coughs> and how not to do things at the same time. Uh, I've had some coaches through the years where I learned good and bad things from them uh, on that. And, and we, we, we see that, and there's good in them, but that's not the end game. Okay? If your child never plays a concert piano, and never gets in Carnegie Hall or, or, or never gets recognized, you know, all they do is play the recorder, that's okay. They're learning a skill that's training their, their brain to do multiple things at once. You ever seen how music affects the brain? How, how it just multifaceted of it just lights up different aspects of the brain all at the same time. That's how women think all the time. Men can't do that, so maybe we need to learn to play an instrument or something uh, on things. But it is, it's amazing, and they may have a natural ability in them. And if they have a natural and you recognize that natural ability, then let's do things to develop that natural ability. If they don't have a natural ability as an athlete, you're probably wasting your money going to AAU classes and teams. Well, um, they're going to be an athlete. No, you're living your childhood. You don't need to live your childhood again. What is their natural ability? Their, their natural ability may be to figure out complex problems 
and they just see it laid out, and they're able to figure it out, and they're able to be an engineer someday or something like that, uh, that, that you look at, and they just look at these complex things, and maybe they become a politician someday. I don't know. Uh, that they, they can read the Constitution. Uh, but it's just all of the different aspects of there's different things. It, well, we have three children in our home. They're all three different. Okay? One is a bookworm. Oh, she loves to read and just consumes it and can tell you every aspect of a story. I, I was driving home uh, with uh, Olivia one night, and I said, all right, tell me about the book you're reading. She literally told me almost every page. I said, summary, summary, that's what I want. I don't need to know every detail of this book, but she knew it because of that aspect of it. it, it there, there are different traits and abilities with, with things that uh, you, you can see and, and change and uh, Nate's a science person and loves experiments. We got, what, three different chemistry sets in our home right now of just, you know, stuff. We're making slime. We're making uh, little glow-in-the-dark balls, bouncy balls. All, he loves that stuff. I don't get science. I had the choice in college of science or math. I chose math. I just, I didn't choose science. Uh, it's just not me, but that's his mind. That's his mindset, and he's very technical with those things. Uh, Amelia, who knows what she's going to be good at. She's pretty much good at everything right now. Uh, it's kindergarten, but okay. Uh, so, but uh, she's just, she's probably the athlete in our family, I would say, uh, on stuff. But they're all three different. They've all got three different abilities, and they all need to be cultivated differently. And they'll all react differently at the same time. I, I, I get uh, nine kids in my class. Each one's going to react differently to my instruction. And to your instruction as a parent, they're going to react differently. Some may be more sensitive than others. Some you may have to be more stern with. Some you may have to explain a few more times uh, in the cultivating because they're all different. And that's good. Now, here's where the problem comes in. Because mom or dad, you think one way. And this is the way it's got to be done. And the child who doesn't think like you, you get frustrated with them. Because they should do it this way. And yet they may figure it out differently than you do. And they may come to the right answer. Or, or, oh, that can be figured out that way. Oh, I didn't know it could be figured out that way. Well, that's really cool. And then praise them that they got it figured out, that they did it. Uh, and then cultivate how they think, how they feel. How, how All of this takes, I'm sorry to say, it takes time. And it takes effort. And it takes observation. And we're the busiest we've ever been, right? And we just don't have the time to take or we don't want to be frustrated with it because they think differently than we do. Okay, I, I got a little frustrated tonight. We're talking about the shoebill stork. You ever heard of it? This giant bird that lives in northeast Africa. Why my children have to choose the hardest to find animals, I do not know, but all of them are really good at it. So we found the shoebill stork lives in northeast Africa. It is 3.8 feet tall. Giant thing. Okay, here's a fun fact. It will hatch one to three eggs. Okay, it will take care of one of them and leave the other two to die. And they keep the other ones fed just a little bit as a backup in case this one's weak. And I went, sounds like my childhood. No. <laughs> Those of you who have three children are going, we could do that. <laughs> I'm learning all this stuff with Nate, and we're doing it, and he's just not quick enough for me. And we sat at the dinner table tonight because this project is due, and I've been out of town for a couple of days and, uh, and wasn't there to work on it with him and, and those type of things, and I was getting frustrated with him because I wanted him to get to the spot where I already was three minutes ago. And I, I got kind of nippy with him. And uh, I just I, I sat back and I went, you know what? I can't do this. I'm, I'm not reacting to him right. And, and we worked on it. We worked through it. I think the project's almost done. We'll probably work on it to about midnight tonight, and we'll turn it in tomorrow. Okay. And I, I, I'm not always the dad who wants to take the time. I'm not always the dad that wants to think the way that someone else thinks. And so when I'm talking about this tonight and developing gifts and abilities, I've got a long way to go on it. But I do believe that it's the right way. 
I just need to practice it. And if I'm confident of who's in the room tonight, you do too. Uh, I don't have kids in my home. You've got grandkids, and they've got shoe bill stork projects to work on. Right? Uh, and, and they've got things that, you know, when they come to Grandpa's house, Grandpa's got a project they can work on or build or do. There's a lawnmower that needs to be fixed or have the blades turned around, you know, outside, or uh, this needs to happen inside. There's a quilt that needs to be made, and uh, there's an opportunity to develop some natural gifts that you see in the lives of your grandchildren. And that could be in all kinds of things. So, so here's something as well. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of going off the rails as usual uh, with stuff. I don't play the piano. I can't help them on the piano. They say, what note is that? It's a black one. I don't know. My wife does, and she works with them. And so she's gifted in that ability, and she can help them. I help them in other areas. But here's what I've, I, I've tried to do. I've tried to learn something about it so that we can have intelligent conversations and we have something that they're interested in that now I know a little bit about to talk with them with. And so I can learn about these things. Sometimes I learn it from them. My daughter took her, her, her phone to me. She said, Dad, look what I learned. Ding, 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 ding. I went, how did you do that? I, I, I can teach you. Went, Great. Usually I'm the one who teaches tech around here. Uh, but <coughs> she taught me something new the other night. And we had a wonderful time doing that. So those are the moments. Those are the little things. We're teaching character. Oh, don't forget character. Character is vital because if they get all the giftedness and you develop every attribute that they have and they miss character, we fail. We've got to teach character. We've got to observe what their gifts are. We've got to observe what they're good at. We've got to observe those things and applaud them when they, they do well uh, in, in this. And so uh, guide them in their spiritual aptitudes. What is their gift that God has for them? Then what is their physical ability? You can develop that to an extent, but I will tell you, you can't make a child run faster. You can't make them jump higher. You, you, you can't make them aim better. You can't do much of that. There's only so much development you can do. I mean, they can practice and practice and practice and practice and practice and shoot 5,000 shots a day and get a D in English. So uh, on that, we, we've got to make sure that we, well-roundedness is a good thing. Why? So they can have poise. They can know what to do. There's so many aspects to this, isn't there? And there's so much in one child that you can get all of these different things. But it takes a parent willing to develop this over time. I got a toddler. Great. We got a long way to go. We got a 14-year-old. You got about six months, it feels like, to, to instill in that. And then when they get to be 16, you can't teach them anything. Because they already know it all. <laughs> no. uh, if you've developed in their life those things and have that relationship, you can still have an influence when they're 42. So, uh, but it takes work and it takes time. Okay? So here's the initiative. Here's the homework. Get to work. Let's develop the next generation for the glory of God. Okay? Let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed. I'm thankful that you're here tonight on this Valentine's Day. Uh, and I hope that you have a great rest of your night and uh, day and the rest of your week. Uh, on Sunday, I, the title of my morning message is this, The Raising of Martha and Mary. Okay, I thought it was the raising of Lazarus. It is. But God raises them up in their faith. And I hope that you can be here to hear about it. All right? Uh, as we close our services in prayer, Mr. Elliot, will you pray for us, sir?